Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Julie Lavacher La Rondo, uh, who is coming here from uh, Montreal, uh, where she's originally from. I mean, she's from, uh, she studied at the University of Montreal for her bachelor, but then she um, went to Cambridge in the UK for her PhD. Uh, and I think we may have overlap there. Although yeah, <laughs> maybe a little bit. <laughs> Um, she then became an Einstein Fellow at the at Stanford University before uh, taking up her current position as a, a professor and current research chair at the Université de Montréal. She works on various aspects of clusters, um, from the properties of the clusters themselves, the massive black holes, and in particular today she will talk about black hole feedback in massive galaxies in clusters. Yes, thank you. Uh, is this working? Yep. OK, perfect. So hi, everyone. Um, oui, je parle français, mais on m'a dit qu'il y avait des gens qui ne parlaient pas français. Uh, donc je vais quand même parler en anglais, mais si vous voulez poser vos questions en français, il n'y a aucun problème. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about black hole feedback in uh, massive galaxies. And today, not only are we now convinced that black holes exist, but we are now also pretty certain that every single galaxy, at least massive galaxy, contains a giant black hole called a supermassive black hole. And why is this important? Well, it's only recently that we've realized just how much of a, a role black holes can have in when galaxies form, how they evolve, uh, and even how they look today. And so my goal today is to convince you and to show you one way that black holes can actually have a tremendous impact on galaxies. But here's a catch about supermassive black holes. So you can, you can kind of think about you have a galaxy and you have a supermassive black hole. Yes, this supermassive black hole is very massive, but if you actually think about it and you do the calculations, you actually see that the black hole is so compact that its physical size is about a billion times smaller than the actual size of the galaxy. And so you could think, well, for a tiny object like that, can it actually do something on a galaxy scale? Uh, and this is what astronomers wondered for a very long time, uh, but it can, and it can do this for uh, two reasons, okay? So first, um, if you actually do the calculations, you can see that black holes, supermassive black holes, although very compact and very small, actually have enough energy uh, to completely unbind a galaxy. And this is because black holes are very efficient at converting mass into energy. And then the other thing that happened and that started uh, uh, making ast astronomers wonder about the role of black holes in galaxy formation and evolution was the discovery of this uh, correlation here that you probably all know very well. It's a correlation between the supermassive black hole mass and the stellar velocity dispersion of a galaxy, which is related to the mass or luminosity of the bulge. And so when they found this correlation, it was, it's, it's, it's not intuitive because, again, the black hole is so small in physical size, it's kind of like saying that this clicker here can suddenly destroy the entire planet, which is not very logical, but it turns out that black holes have a tremendous role uh, in terms of really shaping the properties of galaxies. And I'm going to show you one way that they can do this. And so you can start thinking, well, how do they actually do this? So this is an illustration of a black hole. Uh, so you have a black hole accretion disk here, uh, which uh, essentially when matter gets accreted onto a black hole, it, falls, it forms an accretion disk. This accretion disk becomes very, very hot because everything's moving very quickly. There's a lot of friction. Uh, it shines very brightly at X-ray wavelengths. And so you got a lot of ra radiation pressure. So this is one way that black holes can actually influence their surrounding medium. Uh, radiation pressure does have an impact, but it's, it's uh, a bit difficult to explain how it can do this on very large scales uh, because radiation doesn't couple well with the surrounding medium. It might do this with dust, uh, but this is uh, another topic of research. Winds, the black holes drive lots and lots of um, winds of material to very large distances. We're talking about kiloparsec scales, and they do this when the black hole accretes a lot, when it's in the quasar mode. But today I'm going to be talking mostly about this phase here, which is essentially the jets that black holes form. These jets are made of relativistic particles that are accelerating in magnetic fields. They produce a lot of synchrotron emission, and we use this radio synchrotron emission to study these structures. And what I'm going to show you to kind of set the tone of this presentation is I'm going to show you the image that convinced me to go into this field. Uh, and this is when I really became uh, impressed by black holes. And so this is an image that was, it, it was a press release that appeared back in 2007, so quite some time ago. Uh, you have a massive galaxy here, fairly massive galaxy, which harbors a supermassive black hole that's accreting material. Uh, you have a little galaxy that's orbiting 
uh, around it. And what I'm going to show you next is the same image, but this time in two other wavelengths. I'm going to show you the UV and the radio, which traces the jet of the black hole. And this is what you see. UV is in pink, and blue traces the jet of the black hole. So this really just completely amazed me. You have a tiny, like physically tiny black hole here, yet it is so powerful that it's able to create a jet that no long, not only extends beyond the host galaxy, but is able to crash into the neighboring galaxy and even beyond. And so this is when I knew that I wanted to study this field. Uh, and just to kind of show you even something more impressive is, is if you unzoom from this image, this is what you see. So this is the image that I was showing you before and the radio jets actually extend to this distance here. Okay, so this is the power of black holes. And it turns out that jets actually have a profound impact on their surrounding median, and I'm gonna show you just what, what do they do actually? Do they just plow through the galaxy and do nothing to the galaxy, but do something to their environment? Or do they actually do more? And so this is what I've been studying for the last couple of years, is really trying to understand black hole feedback uh, in massive galaxies, especially this jet mode, uh, it's essentially when black holes tend to accrete uh, at low rates, they tend to form these jets. So they're in the relatively inefficient phase. And when I tell my students that we're going to study black holes, we're going to understand what they do to galaxies, and then I tell them we're going to do this in clusters, they, they kind of stop and say, how is this, why clusters? It doesn't seem very interesting. Um, it turns out that clusters of galaxies are one of the best places to study this kind of feedback. And I'm going to show you the classical examples, uh, example uh, that will maybe convince you that this is the case. So the classical example here is the Perseus cluster of galaxies. So uh, a cluster contains hundreds to thousands of galaxies all bound together by gravity. And what's interesting is that at the center of clusters of galaxies, we usually find one large dominant galaxy. Uh, this galaxy is called the brightest cluster galaxy. So it dominates in mass and size. Uh, they are very, very old galaxies that have existed for a long time. It took them a long time to build their masses. Just as a comparison here, this is the size of the Milky Way. So you can compare it to the size of this giant elliptical galaxy. So they're much more massive. And it turns out that we study clusters a lot with X-ray telescopes. And the reason for this is because clusters contain a lot of hot intracluster gas which shines brightly at X-ray wavelengths. Uh, so clusters tend to be embedded. Uh, they contain lots of galaxies, but they're embedded in a lot of hot gas, which uh, we see through X-ray observations. The reason for this is actually quite simple. It's because you have a giant gravitational potential well with lots of galaxies, lots of dark matter. And so any gas that falls into this potential well feels the energy of the potential. Uh, and just through the Virial uh, theorem, you can calculate that uh, the temperature of this gas will be about 10 million degrees. And so when the gas is that hot, it shines naturally in X-rays. And so people have been studying the X-ray emission to look at the, the hot gas between galaxies, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. So if you take an image with the Chandra X-ray telescope, this is what you get. Okay, so the blue here is the hot X-ray gas. Uh, the X-ray gas actually extends much further away but it's highly peaked, so there's much more emission at the center. That's why we see it mostly at the center, but it actually extends to megaparsec scales. Uh, and what you see is that this gas is not just a big blob. There's a lot of structure to this hot gas that's between the galaxies. You see these cavities here, uh, these cavities here, lots and lots of interesting structure. And there's a lot of uh, astronomers that study uh, the, the, the dynamics of this structure because it teaches you a lot about plasma physics. Uh, because essentially this hot gas is a plasma. But I'll be focusing on the structures that we see here, which are essentially what we call cavities. And what's happening is that you have a massive galaxy here. This massive galaxy harbors a supermassive black hole. This black hole is accreting, creating a jet. Uh, this jet, we see it at radio wavelengths, so that's the pink that you see here. And this jet, what it's essentially doing is that it's essentially pushing away the hot X-ray gas and creating these cavities. So it's actually doing work to push away the gas. And you can actually calculate the work, uh, the energy it takes to literally push away this gas. The, the comparison I usually give in, 
in Montreal and Canada because there's a lot of snow. Uh, it's kind of like the machines that remove the snow off the road, the snow plows. It takes a lot of energy to do this. And we can use these cavities as calorimeters to calculate how much energy does it take to push away the gas, and that gives us a constraint on how much energy the, the black hole is injecting to do this. And so that's how we can kind of start to understand the energetics of black hole feedback and just exactly how much energy it's injecting into its medium. These cavities are made of buoyantly rising gas. And so what you see here is an older cavity, which has risen buoyantly, uh, kind of like uh, essentially bubbles in uh, air bubbles in water. They rise uh, buoyantly throughout the water. And here we have a, a bubble uh, in astronomy here. So it's the same physics exactly the same physics as we use here, just on astronomical scales. Uh, and so this is what we've been studying, is we've been trying to understand exactly what these outflows are. You can notice here uh, that there's not a lot of radio emission in these older cavities, uh, and this is simply because as radio particles age, uh, those radio particles that contain in the jets, they age, uh, they lose energy, especially those at high frequency, and so we tend to see the older outflows in lower and lower frequencies at radio wavelengths. Uh, and so this has been the main, uh, my main subject of research, is understanding this feedback in clusters. And I hope I've convinced you that, at least energetically, black hole jets can actually inject some energy into their surroundings. Uh, and so the question is, what have we actually learned from these clusters in the last 10, 20 years? What do we know about jet mode feedback? Uh, and especially, what, it is, is, uh, what do we know about its role in terms of what it does to a galaxy? So what we found was that we find these cavities, these uh, AGN-driven cavities in clusters. We find them in groups. So this is this, the center, uh, central galaxy in a group. Uh, and we also see the jets. We also see the X-ray emission. We see them in more massive ellipticals, but not at the centers of groups and clusters. And this galaxy here is massive enough that it contains a hot halo that we see at X-ray wavelengths. And uh, thanks to that, we can actually see what the, the jets are doing to their medium. One of the key points I want to make here is the reason why clusters are so interesting and why these systems are great to study feedback is because we actually see the surrounding medium around galaxies. If you take a massive galaxy and you put it re really isolated, if it's not massive enough, the halo that surrounds it won't be hot enough, so we won't see it at x-rays. Uh, we might see it at other wavelengths, but te telescopes have a hard time trying to uh, see this environment. Whereas here we see... Sorry, I will try and fix that. Okay, let's give that a go. Um, so here we actually see the surrounding environment, and we can see what jets do to their environment because we, uh, we see that. If you take the same galaxy... Okay, is that okay? I don't think that's normal. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I need it, so I think I'll, I'll just go like that. Um, okay, so, uh, and so if, you, if you just have that galaxy and it's not massive enough to, to have a halo that you see well at X-ray wavelengths, you'll see the jet, but you won't see what the jet is actually doing to its environment. So this is why we use these objects to study that. But the fundamental point here is that essentially what this shows is that uh, as long as you have a black hole, as long as this black hole is accreting and creating a jet, this jet will, will do something to its surrounding medium, to its surrounding gas. Uh, and so this is a key point. And if you actually do the calculations of how much energy is injected here, uh, you find that typically it's about 10 to the 60 Earth. This is huge energy. Okay? So there's a lot, it's enough to completely suppress star formation. It's enough to completely modify the properties of galaxies. Uh, what we found also by studying these objects is what, what, how do they actually inject energy? So they do work to inflate these cavities, but we've also found evidence that there are small shock fronts that surround these jets. Uh, the Mach numbers tend to be quite small, so they're not strong shocks. They're, they're about Mach 1.2, 1.5, sometimes Mach 2. Uh, so they're not very strong shocks, yet if you calculate the energies uh, using uh, hydrodynamic equations for shock fronts, you see that it's typically these kinds of energies, these kinds of power. Just as a comparison, 
Uh, just as a comparison, a quasar, for example, emits about 10 to the 46, 47 ergs per second. Okay, so this is quite a substantial amount of energy. It can have a very large impact on the galaxy. Thank you. Okay. On the larger scales, we found evidence by studying the structure of this hot gas that in addition to shock fronts, we see evidence of sound waves that are propagating that come from these jets on hundreds of kiloparsec scales. So the jets have a very uh, large influence, not only on the galaxy, but up to 100 or even 200 kiloparsecs. So that's a very large scale. Uh, there's also evidence that there are fluctuations in the hot X-ray gas that are consistent with turbulence being driven by these jets. And again, we're talking about very large uh, energies. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the key findings. More recently, we've also seen that jets can actually drive metals out of galaxies. So quasars not only do this, jets do this as well. Uh, and so this is one example here of a, a famous cluster. This is the Chandra. No, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I need one. Oh, or me recording. Okay, okay. Okay. So uh, I will try to continue. <laughs> um, so if you look at the, the X ray map the, of the hot intercluster medium, one of the very neat things you can do about it is you can get a spectrum for every single pixel in your X ray image. This spectrum gives you the metallicity of the gas, of the hot intercluster gas. You plot this, and this is what you get. Uh, the blue is low metallicity, the red, pink is high metallicity. So the jets appear to be taking metals from the central galaxy and dragging it, not just to a one kiloparsec scale, but dozens and even in this case hundreds of kiloparsecs. So this is what jets can do. More recently, there have been a lot of work by Brian McNamara in Canada as well and Helen Russell, who have been working on ALMA observations. Uh, these galaxies contain a lot of molecular gas, and this gas appears to be dragged out by the jets, and we're talking about large outflows uh, that are dragging this amount of molecular gas. This is a lot of molecular gas. Exactly how jets do that, we still don't know, but we can see that they are able to do it. So jets do have a very large impact in many, many different ways. Uh, what I've been working on is trying to understand is this something that we only see at very low redshifts? Or is this something that perhaps we're seeing over a long period of time? And the reason for this is because until a couple of years ago, most of the studies that have been looking at these jets in clusters and groups and massive ellipticals uh, focus on very nearby systems. And by nearby, I mean below redshift 0.3. So that's about three gig years uh, in time or less. Uh, and so the question that I ask myself is, can we see the same jets, the same kind of feedback at high redshift? And does this mean that this kind of feedback has been operating for a very long time, and therefore that jets have been having a tremendous impact on their galaxies and surrounding medium for a long time? And this is a fundamental process in galaxy evolution and formation. And so what I did was I took uh, several different samples, including uh, a new sample of clusters of galaxies that have been discovered with the South Pole Telescope. The South Pole Telescope is in the South Pole. It uses the SZ effect, the sunyav zeldovich effect, to find clusters of galaxies. It's very good at finding high redshift clusters. Uh, the sunyav zeldovich effect, very quickly, is essentially you have the cosmic microwave background sending a bunch of photons. Uh, if, it, if these photons pass through a cluster, they will get uh, uh, redshifted and blue shifted. And essentially, we can pick up that signal uh, on, in our telescopes. And wherever we see little spots where that's happening, we know it's a cluster because that, that, uh, those photons from the cosmic microwave background are interacting with the particles in the cluster. Whereas if they pass through nothing, so no cluster, they won't have uh, been redshifted and blue shifted. And so we can use this technique to find clusters. This is what they look like. Uh, so this is the mass distribution of clusters. So clusters are very massive structures as a function of redshift. Uh, all of the previous samples that uh, found clusters are in red and, uh, and mostly in blue, but also in red. Uh, this is Planck, 
and look at the blue clusters here. They were finding lots of low redshift clusters, which was great. And now with SPT, which are the clusters shown in black, we're extending the mass range to very, very high redshifts. And so we can start to understand how just in general clusters evolve with time, but also what the central uh, galaxy and the central EGN are doing to their uh, medium and how this evolves with time. Uh, what's great about this sample is that there's a lot of Chandra data. So this is the Chandra data, the X-ray maps that we need to study these cavities uh, that are being created by jets. Uh, so this is a large program that was PI'd by Brad Benson, uh, who obtained one megasecond of Chandra observations uh, to do this. Uh, we have another high uh, redshift sample at even higher redshift here, the PI with Michael McDonald. I've been leading more detailed follow-ups follow of individual clusters uh, to try and do this, but we have a lot of great Chandra data, X-ray data to do this. So that was one of the, the great things about the sample. The main results, oh, before I forget, SP33G is happening now. Uh, this is an upgrade to the telescope that will find the lower mass clusters out to very high redshifts. And so this is really a great field to be in uh, currently. Lots of new results happening. In terms of energy, uh, what is going on with the outflows of jets that we see in clusters as a function of time? This is the power in cavities uh, for uh, various samples that I'll explain in, in one second versus what we call the cooling luminosity of the cluster. Uh, this is related to you have a cluster of galaxy, lots of hot X-ray gas, uh, when it's very, very peaked, when the X-ray emission is very peaked, you can actually calculate how much time it takes for this gas to cool and fo form stars at the center, so on the central galaxy. This time scale is actually very short. It's about 10 to the 8 years, so that's less than a Hubble time. And so the gas should have had the time to cool, and so we should see lots of star formation. But thanks to the feedback that's happening in these central galaxies, this feedback is preventing this gas from cooling. But it's just a, an indication to see just how much, uh, essentially, gas should be cooling. Uh, and what you see is that the more the gas should be cooling, the more powerful the feedback is uh, so that it can suppress this cooling. The black points are the local uh, clusters, groups, and giant ellipticals which have these cavities. And so you can kind of just see from the numbers here, if you compare the numbers, it's a one-to-one -one relation. So this just means that this feedback that's happening in these jets is capable of suppressing this cooling, so suppressing the star formation. The green and blue points are the high redshift clusters. So I remember when we found this result, what, what really surprised us was, essentially, if you look at the numbers, the, the high redshift clusters are, don't have more powerful feedback happening in them. They're not systematically above the relation. They're not systematically under the relation. They're just essentially the same as the local clusters. So what this meant was that the feedback that we're seeing in these massive galaxies located at the centers of clusters is just as powerful as we walk back in time. And we're talking about redshift one-ish, so this is about eight gig years in the in, back in time. So these jets have been having such a profound impact on these galaxies, on these clusters, for over eight gig years. It's not just now. This is something that's very long-lived, and this is a, one of the main results that we've been getting. This is a fundamental process that's happening in massive galaxies for very long time scales. Very quickly, I'll just mention some preliminary results. We've been looking at, we looked at the jets, seeing what they're doing. Uh, this time we looked at the radiative emission in X-rays from the central AGN. Are, uh, is there evidence that maybe the black holes are accreting more? as we go back in time, which uh, is uh, what we've been finding in general. Black holes tend to be more active at high redshift in terms of accretion rates. Uh, so this is just a preliminary plot, but it shows a fraction of galaxies at the centers of clusters with bright, uh, relatively efficient AGN. So this is going up in redshift. So what this means is we're maybe essentially witnessing the transition between black holes that are in this quasar mode at high redshift uh, down to the jet mode, uh, uh, relatively inefficient low accretion rates at local redshifts. So one of the things that I've been looking at, in addition to this feedback and understanding its role in galaxies in general, uh, has been to look in more detail at these radio particles. Okay? It turns out that, OK, we have this radio emission in these jets. But it, it turns out that if you point a radio telescope on these structures, it, you actually see something else in addition to these jets. You actually see. So these jets, 
And then you see something very blobby in radio emission. So your, your uh, radio telescope will, will detect this large structure here. It's a bunch of radio emission. But the question is, what is it? Okay, what, are the, what can produce radio emission on hundreds of kiloparsec scales that is just kind of, not, it's not in the form of jets, it's just this blobby emission. To be able to get radio emission uh, from synchrotron, you need relativistic particles, you need magne and magnetic fields. Clusters harbor lots of embedded magnetic fields in the intracluster medium, so that's not a problem. But the problem is relativistic particles. What this means is that there is a bunch of relativistic particles here. They can come from the central AGN through the jets, which eventually kind of filter out and become these relativistic particles. But the problem is the time scale from when these uh, radio particles go from here to here is quite long, even if they travel at the speed of light. By then, they shouldn't have energy to be relativistic. They shouldn't emit radio emission. And so astronomers started finding these sources about uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, and uh, more recently now with LOFAR and other radio telescopes like that. These structures just started popping up. We said, well, what is this? Well, what is producing this radio emission? And uh, where do these uh, radio particles go? Why do they go to, out to these distances? So I've been looking into this to try and understand this. And uh, the best target to do this is, again, the Perseus cluster because it's so nearby, it's so well studied. And so we said, let's look at the, this radio diffuse structure in this system here. Uh, and so what we did was we said, this, this radio emission tends to be very faint. So let's go for the best radio telescope at the time to try and study this uh, as best as we could. Uh, this was a project that was done with a very large array. Back in 2012, it was upgraded. So the very large array exists from the 1980s, but recently in 2012, it was fully upgraded. Uh, it became much more uh, um, sensitive to radio emission. A lot of interesting science has been done since then. Uh, the VLA is composed of 27 antennas that you can move around along tracks to vary the angular resolution of the emission that you're seeing. Uh, and so we said, let's go for this, this uh, telescope uh, since it's been upgraded. We got a proposal that was accepted in 2013. It was one of the shared risk proposals, which essentially means it, it was one of the first observations taken with this upgraded uh, telescope. Uh, we took observations at low frequencies uh, to try and study this, uh, this um, uh, system of radio emission surrounding the central galaxy in the Perseus cluster. Uh, five hours in B configuration and A configuration. Uh, I'm going to show you the results in B configuration. Uh, and one of the great things about this, this is my PhD student that reduced this data. Uh, I remember the first day that she started her PhD, I went to her and I said, here's a project. This is going to be the most horrible data set you will ever work with. Um, but it, it might get really nice results. And the reason for this is because Okay, it was a new instrument on the VLA. Uh, new instruments, we, we didn't know exactly how they worked, what were the limitations, so we learned that in the process. Uh, there's a lot of RFI, so interference at low frequencies. Uh, so this is why uh, low frequency radio observations tend to be more difficult. And the key point is that the central AGN is very radio luminous. It's about 11 Janskys, which is very, very bright uh, for radio AGN. And the problem with this is that if you want to look at very faint emission around it, it's your very dynamic range limited. Uh, because the brighter central AGN, the, the harder it is to get that noise level down to see the faint emission. Uh, but she worked really hard, and I'm going to show you what the results are. So this is a previous image that I've shown you many times. Uh, this is a previous radio map that exists from the 1990s. So it wasn't redone until uh, recently, until about two years ago. Uh, again, because of all of these challenges that exist. The previous radio mission actually extends a little bit further here, just to be fair, okay? And I'll show you the new radio map. This is what it looks like, okay? So you have this gigantic structure of radio mission. This is what we call a mini halo in clusters. Uh, we know they're related to the central AGN which probably injects lots of relativistic particles over its lifetime. These par particles propagate to large distances. But one of the key points is that what keeps them relativistic? Uh, there's something that you need to be able to reaccelerate them. Uh, people have been talking about maybe 
the dynamics of the hot gas, the hot gas is not stable, it moves around, maybe this uh, creates uh, some uh, energy and turbulence to reaccelerate the particles. Some features here are actually related to this, this dynamic of the hot X-ray gas. They correlate with some structures in the hot X-ray gas that we know are, are attributed to, to this uh, moving around of the gas. Uh, there are these kind of, it's hard to see here, but these, these filaments that are statistically significant. So it's kind of like the structure is being shredded apart. I have no idea what these are. We're still trying to understand them, uh, but those are present. And in general, there's an elongation of this, this uh, mini halo along the jet axis of the central black hole, which is injecting jets along this axis here. We can see that it's been doing this uh, in this axis for a long time. And so maybe what's happening is that the central black hole, in addition to creating these jets, which are interacting with the, with the hot X-ray gas, creating these cavities, they're driving metals out, they're driving outflows in the galaxy, Maybe these jets are also reaccelerating the old relativistic particles and creating these radio structures. And so uh, when, I, when I look at this, I kind of think about where we are now and like what's the greater message of this. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at a, a bit of just history about how uh, this, this field changed as a function of time, before Chandra was launched, we had X-ray telescopes, but they didn't really have a good spatial resolution. Uh, we could see that clusters had lots of hot gas, but we didn't know what the structure of this hot gas was. And so when Chandra will, was launched, it completely changed our view of this hot X-ray gas in clusters and groups. We saw that thanks to the really incredible spatial resolution of Chandra, we see so much structure. Uh, this has taught us a lot about uh, AGN feedback, of course, but also uh, plasma astrophysics, uh, magnetic fields, uh, turbulence in mediums. Uh, just how these structures um, can teach us about those properties. Uh, and so what I, when I think about the radio community for clusters of galaxies, uh, before, maybe a couple of years ago, we knew that ra clusters of galaxies had a central galaxy with a very massive black hole. This was creating jets. We kind of knew that there were these structures called mini halos, uh, but we thought that they were just blobby structures. And then we get this image with the VLA, which is essentially 10 times deeper than any other radio observation of this cluster before. It's five times higher resolution. And the combination of the two meant that we started seeing so much structure uh, in these uh, radio structures that we see in clusters. And that these structures are directly related, again, to the dynamics of the hot gas, but also potentially the central black hole. And so this is, again, kind of revealing just what black holes can do they, they do a lot not only for galaxies by preventing star formation, by redistributing metals, uh, by creating shock fronts. Uh, I would argue that black hole, especially in this jet mode, also have a profound impact on the non-thermal particles that are embedded in their surroundings by providing maybe the seed particles, but also re-energizing them uh, for very long time scales. And the only reason that we see so much detail in this object here is because we have these new observations that are much better than before, but also Perseus is very near, is very close to us, so we have the opportunity to see so much structure. And this is maybe what's happening in every single cluster, uh, but just because they're further away, it's harder to see. Uh, so I've, I hope I've convinced you a bit more about what clusters of galaxies allow us to study in terms of what black holes actually do to their environment in this jet mode uh, when they have a jet just how much of an impact they can have into their surrounding. And so the, the last part that I want to go through is uh, I want to look at how gas cools and gets heated by black hole feedback. So one of the fundamental questions that we are trying to understand is how galaxies form and evolve. Uh, when they're forming and uh, at the beginning there's a lot of hot gas, it cools, maybe it gets, this gas gets reheated by black holes. Uh, and so uh, I've been trying to understand this process and especially what jets and black hole feedback can do to this gas, how they can actually re reheat it in more detail. And so uh, it turns out that clusters of galaxies are really great for studying this. And I'm going to show you why. So this you've seen many times. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the X-ray and radio. Okay, so you have just the, this is the SDSS image of the central galaxy you would see a, a giant elliptical galaxy. Elliptical galaxies should be red and dead, 
right? That's the classical example that, uh, or understanding that we have. If I place an H alpha filter on this galaxy, H alpha usually traces star formation. So you would say, well, it's an, a giant elliptical galaxy, so it shouldn't have any H alpha emission or not a lot. This is what it looks like at H alpha. Uh, so this is essentially a huge filamentary system, uh, which is called an optical nebula, optical filaments in the literature. This galaxy is booming in H alpha emission. We're talking about 10 to the 42 orgs per second. It's very, very bright. So when, when astronomers found this, they said, aha, this must be star forming. It's H alpha. This must be uh, booming in star formation. All of the gas that you see that lights up in H alpha, most of it is not star forming. Okay? It's being lit up at H alpha wavelength, so that traces about 10,000 degree gas, but it is not star forming. There is something different going on in these systems. What's going on is we now think that this H alpha gas is related to the hot intracluster medium, which is partially able to cool, so the feedback isn't suppressing completely the star formation. It cools a little bit, but Again, related to, uh, to the black hole, maybe it's not able to, to completely form stars. It's a very complex system. And so we wanted to study this. Uh, and just to let you know, Perseus is not the only one that has this, these optical filaments. Uh, many, many central galaxies and clusters of galaxies have these very large, uh, we're talking about dozens of kiloparsec scale filaments. Uh, they have been extensively, extensively studied. Some of them have star formation, some of them don't. Uh, so understanding exactly how the gas is able to cool from hot uh, X-ray emission down to H alpha emission and even the molecular phase is a fundamental process in galaxy uh, evolution that we're trying to understand. And in these, these objects, we can maybe try and understand that uh, in more detail and just understand what the black hole does to these systems. So these filaments have been studied for many, many years. Uh, I can tell you that about 30% of, uh, of galaxies located at the centers of clusters of brightest cluster galaxies contain these filaments. So it's not only one or two objects, it's quite common. Uh, they're found predominantly in these clusters that have cool cores, so very uh, peaked X-ray surface brightness distributions. This is where we see feedback going on. So that's where they're located. So they're kind of related to feedback in that sense. They're very, very thin. They're very long and thin. There have been observations with the Hubble Space Telescope that has resolved these filaments. They're only about 60, 70 parsecs wide. They're very thin, and sometimes they extend to about 50 kiloparsecs in length. Okay, so that's it's interesting physics going on in these systems. They're very H alpha luminous. They tend to coincide with cold molecular gas uh, and soft X-ray emission, but the majority are not tracing star formation. So people have been trying to say, said, well, what creates these filaments? What's happening? Uh, and so there's been a lot of work understanding uh, the, these clusters here. Uh, there's essentially, they seem to be really filled with dust. And so dust is very difficult to build. You usually you need to build it in galaxies. So it would argue that maybe these filaments are being dragged out from the central galaxy and that's why they have dust. Uh, if you look at the spectra, they're, they're, they have very weird spectra. Um, you, kinda, you need some kind of high excitation particle, uh, maybe some shocks to be able to explain these spectra. So they're not typically the kind of spectra that you see in galaxies. There, there's something else going on. And so we wanted to, to study this. We wanted to bring something new to the table. We wanted to do something, uh, to learn something new. So again, we targeted this, this fantastic laboratory, Perseus, uh, and we ta targeted this nebula here, which is about 100 kiloparsecs in diameter. The problem with this, this uh, object is that although it's very nearby, although it has an H alpha system which is intrinsically very H alpha luminous, very large, the problem is that it's actually too large. Okay? Um, it's, it, unfortunately, it happens sometimes in astronomy. Uh, Perseus is so close that about 90 kiloparsecs equals to about four arc minutes. When you have a system that is H alpha bright, maybe one of the first things that you want to do is you want to get IFU data. You want to study the kinematics of this H-alpha gas. And so I'm just plotting here the fields of view that you have of Muse and Symphony, just to kind of compare. So you could do this with an 8-meter telescope, but it would take a lot of pointings to cover the whole thing. And so this is why, although Perseus has been studied in great detail, uh, until 
recently we haven't been able to study in detail the kinematics of this nebula in H alpha because of this large field of view. I'll just show you some of the previous velocity fields that we have of this structure. This is dating back from 2001. Uh, it's a velocity field of the central region here. So you can kind of see that the velocity structure is somewhat chaotic. Uh, maybe there's rotation going on, it's, uh, but it's only the central part. A couple of years later, Nina Hatch uh, did this a great work putting uh, essentially slits on a bunch of filaments and trying to understand the kinematics. You see the velocity gradients. Uh, this structure here is called a horseshoe nebula because it looks like a horseshoe and it's actually being dragged out by uh, one of the older outflows of the central black hole. So there is a connection there. But again, because it's so big, it's been difficult to study. Uh, this has now changed thanks to a new instrument uh, that is available on the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. Uh, so we have this great telescope that we can both use uh, in Hawaii. It's a four meter telescope. And there's this new instrument called CITEL. Has anybody heard of CITEL? No? Okay, oh, yeah, okay. So you can, you can use it from here, from France. So it might be something that you, you might wanna use in the future. What's great about CITEL uh, is that it has a field of view of 11 arc minutes by 11 arc minutes, okay? So it's a gigantic field of view. It's an optical imaging uh, Fourier um, transform spectrometer. So essentially for every single pixel in that 11 by 11 arc minute field of view, every single pixel you get a spectrum. Okay, so that's great. Uh, and so we just said this is perfect. Uh, this is exactly what is needed for this kind of galaxy. And what's great is that since and the central galaxy in the Perseus cluster was so H alpha bright, it was part of uh, one of the first science verification observations that were taken. And so they took these observations of about two hours that covered uh, essentially many, many different kinds of wavelengths. And I'm gonna show you the data to show you what we see. So this is a little video. There we go. Uh, so this is a video that's gonna show you the cube of data. You're gonna go from O1 to N2, H alpha N2. You're gonna notice something very strange happening here. This is actually an infalling galaxy that's falling towards the central galaxy in this cluster, and then the S2 lines. We got the O1. N2, H alpha, N2. This weird structure here, infalling galaxy. And then finally, the S2 lines. So note that this is a video. We actually detect uh, the S2 emission to very large radii. So it's just a video that's it's kind of hard to bring out the filaments, but it's just an idea to, to show you what we can actually do. Uh, so this is the first time that we're seeing the H alpha emission in this galaxy in velocity uh, in velocity dimensions, so we're actually able to get the velocity field of the entire nebula here. Uh, just a couple of notes, we were also able to get the N2, so we can look at the line ratio, see how this varies with, ra uh, with radius. Uh, the S2 lines are really, really neat, because when you get both of them, if you divide one with another, you get information on the density of the gas, which we can compare to the density of the hot X-ray gas, for example. Uh, so I'm gonna just show you the H alpha velocity field, but it's just to let you know that there's a lot of great science that's going to come out of this data set. So this is the velocity field that we find. Okay, Velocity, this is the intensity map here, velocity field. These are the units here. What's really great about this, and this is a paper published by my PhD student last year, is that it's very chaotic. You look at the velocity from one pixel to the next, it can vary tremendously. It's a very chaotic field. And this is telling us something fundamental about how gas cools from X-ray temperatures down to H alpha temperatures. It's, it's not a smooth problem. There's something chaotic about it, something turbulent about it. Uh, so that was interesting. There's no general rotation going on throughout the entire system. You might think if the hot X-ray gas may be rotating, which is a question that we're asking our, ourselves, and maybe we'll answer that in a couple of years. Uh, and, this, and the gas is cooling from this hot X-ray gas. Maybe that should be rotating too. We don't see a general rotation structure. Uh, we see associations with shock fronts, uh, where there's a shock front uh, driven by the jet, the velocity dispersion of the H alpha gas goes up. So it's feeling the shock. Uh, lots of really interesting things that we're noticing uh, in this system. Uh, one of the results that we can see 
uh, is this cluster. It was actually one of the few targets that was observed with the Hitomi uh, X-ray telescope that was launched maybe two years ago. Uh, Hitomi was this great uh, X-ray telescope, and one of the great things about it is that it had a very high spectral resolution. So we were going to study the kinematics of the hot gas. Unfortunately, it ended its mission uh, very early, um, and so it was only able to observe Perseus and I think one other source. But what came out of it, the main result that came out of it, is that the hot X-ray gas is not very turbulent. Okay, it's a, this is a, the velocity dispersion of the hot X-ray gas. Uh, it's it's a medium. Although you have this hot gas, this strong potential, lots of feedback going on, it's not a super turbulent medium, which is interesting. Uh, we look at the, the velocity dispersion of the H-alpha gas. It's very, very similar. Okay, so the velocity dispersion may be feeling the same kind of turbulence as a hot X-ray gas. So that, again, may be teaching us something fundamental about how gas cools from hot X-ray wavelengths to H-alpha temperatures. Uh, you can look at the, you can compare the H-alpha emission so this is the velocity field of H-alpha versus the velocity field of the cold molecular gas to see how it cools from H-alpha phase to cold molecular. Uh, this is the velocity field in the same scale, so it's the same scale for both. Uh, and what I'm going to just highlight are a couple of regions here, 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 uh, just taken kind of randomly. But the key point is that the velocities are very similar. The velocity of the 10,000 degree gas is very similar to the velocity of the cold molecular gas. So that's also interesting because that's telling us again how the gas is able to cool and how those two are connected to each other, even if they have very different temperatures. So the main conclusion I want to leave you with here is uh, I hope I've convinced you that black hole feedback in the form of jets can have a profound impact on its surrounding medium uh, by either injecting lots of energy driving shock fronts, turbulence. Uh, it can also, jets can also drive lots of uh, metals out of the galaxy, lots of molecular outflows that are comparable in energies to the quasar-driven uh, outflows uh, that we see. Uh, I've, I hope I've convinced you that this, these jets can also maybe have an impact on the non-thermal population, so on the relativistic particles throughout the surrounding medium, that they can reaccelerate these, um, and how jets can influence how gas cools from X-ray wavelengths uh, down to the H-alpha and even molecular phase. And I will take questions. Thank you, Julie. Uh, questions? Thank you very much for nice results. Uh, I was uh, wondering about the uh, radio, your yes. radio VLMF. Uh, have you uh, superposed with uh, X-ray and H-alpha because you, you expect in shocks that the Fermi uh, mechanism accelerates yes. the electrons? Uh, so let me see if you I should find know. some, uh, like in relics? Yes. Okay, so uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, so there, there are, we, we have found associations. So here, uh, what's interesting is that um, we, we do find an enhancement of radio emission. Uh, we also, okay, this is a B configuration data. We have A configuration, which is higher resolution. It's not as sensitive to the extended emission, but it's higher resolution. And we see that there is radio emission associated with the H alpha filaments that extend to the north. So there is a connection there. Uh, I know that some colleagues that are studying cosmic rays coming from jets argue that um, they should be related to these H alpha filaments. So that might be a connection, but we do see connections uh, and, and here, yes. So you mentioned the origin of the, this radio relics, this cosmic population by the yeah. central agent source. What makes it more realistic that it's seeded by the agent rather than the large scale shocks, for instance? So a large scale shocks in terms of cluster the, the cosmic info of, of matter. Okay, yeah, yeah, so the co those will be like out to about two megapar one, two megaparsec scale, so they're much larger. Uh, it's, it's, okay, so there are two uh, theories currently for the origin of these structures. One, you get a seed population of particles, of relativistic particles that have aged a little bit, that are no longer relativistic, and then you reaccelerate them. Uh, that is very easy to do. Uh, but you need a seed population. Here, naturally, the central AGN could be one of these. 
Uh, so that's, that's one of the, and uh, this is indicating that it's, we're going in that direction. Uh, there's another group of, uh, of people that are arguing that uh, essentially hadronic origin, so you get uh, very energetic cosmic rays that interact with the particles of the hot gas, and it creates new relativistic particles. Uh, and so that should have associations with the hot X-ray gas. Distinguishing between the two is very difficult. Okay. Uh, what we also see in clusters are, these are called mini halos. We see very large uh, mega parsec scale diffuse radio emissions, which are called radio halos. Those are found in merging clusters, and those are definitely associated with the shock fronts. Uh, and we see radio relics in those structures, which are, we think now are old relativistic electrons being reaccelerated by shock fronts driven from the merger of clusters. So those are definitely uh, interesting. And just in general, studying these structures are interesting because we can learn at how relativistic particles get reaccelerated, how they're created. So it's a whole other field, which is interesting. Uh, do I understand correctly that uh, one can uh, deduce from uh, this work that uh, jets do not contribute important, in an important way to the M sigma relation, which is which is universal, but this yeah. is not universal. So. Is it so, so I would argue this is universal. I would argue that as long as you have a black hole in a galaxy that's creating a jet, it will do something to its galaxy. Uh, the M-sigma relation is very interesting because it seems to be created uh, at very high redshifts. Uh, when the black hole is accreting a lot, this black hole, when it accretes a lot, may create jets. It doesn't always do, but it creates a lot of radiation and it creates a lot of winds. So. Uh, People argue that maybe the M sigma relation is, is more driven by uh, galaxy formation at high redshift, which is more mergers, which is black holes accreting at high rates. Uh, what we're showing here is that bl uh, black holes that are accreting at lower rates, that are, when they do that, they drive very easily jets, have an impact. And the key point is that they do this since redshift one or even more. So they do this for a long time. It not maybe as it maybe not be as explosive at a, as a high redshift, but it's over a very long time, and so I think it does play a very fundamental role in galaxy evolution. So I had a comment and question: If you see um, if there's any hadronic acceleration, you might expect to see Fermi gamma rays. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting mm -hmm. thing to look for. Uh, and people have looked, and we have not found. Uh, we have found uh, a little bit of gamma ray emission with some clusters, for example, M87, but it has a very, very bright <coughs> central EGN, which may explain all the gamma ray emission. Uh, people have looked in other clusters very deeply for gamma ray emission associated with the extended hot gas. We don't see any. So, and so my question was, you showed this beautiful comparison of the cold molecular gas and the H alpha emission. So given you have cold molecular gas, some of that's dense, some it could be making stars. So could any of that H alpha emission be due to star formation, dense knots perhaps, have you looked for that? Yes, let me show you, I have an extra slide to show you where the star, the, the, the filaments in Perseus are mostly not star forming. Uh, some of them have star formation and I'm gonna show you which ones when I get there. I have too many extra slides. And I can't see the mouse, so I can't actually pick the one, so I have to walk through them. Um, okay, I'm not gonna get there. Let me, let me see if I can find the mouse. Nope, it's not on that side. Ah, there we go, okay. okay. Okay, I'm not finding it. So let me, let me just go back to the molecular gas and I will show you exactly where the star formation is. Okay, uh, so what's interesting about these filaments is the idea is that they may be cooling from the hot gas, H alpha, molecular gas, and then the majority do not form stars. It stops at the molecular phase. Uh, there is a little bit of star formation uh, in this region here, if I remember correctly, in this region here too. It's a tiny fraction of the filaments. We, n we now think that uh, when you look at the molecular clouds, especially from ALMA, they're very, they're, their velocity dispersions is very low. They're not turbulent clouds. They're very dense and uh, not a lot of turbulence there. We think that there's some kind of pressure support that's preventing it from collapsing. 
exactly what that, it could be magnetic fields. There's lots of magnetic field uh, structures here. But something that we still don't understand fully as to why there's so much gas that's able to cool to the molecular phase. We're talking about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, even 10 to the 11 solar masses of molecular gas. And yet it doesn't form stars. Uh, I have a question coming back to the, um, the radio halo that you observe. Uh, maybe a naive question, but uh, could there be a contribution from the other galaxies than the BCG in the cluster, or only the BCG is emitting jets? Uh, so if you take a picture, uh, um, a radio picture of a cluster, let's say the Perseus cluster, and you look at all the galaxies that are creating jets, uh, I actually have an image here. Um, so this is, the, this is the VLA observations that I showed you. Okay? So this is actually the mini halo you see at the center. Okay? Uh, this is what it looks like on the large scale. One of the great things about the VLA is that the field of view is very large, so you get lots of information. Uh, there are not a lot of galaxies that are as massive here uh, as this one in a cluster. This one really dominates in size and mass. Uh, there are not a lot of galaxies that have jets. This one is one example here, which it does. Uh, so this could be contributing to the particles, but the mini halo is down here. Okay, so for the particles to get there, it would be, take a long time. This is actually uh, an infalling galaxy which has jets, and it's, um, the jets are being pushed back because of the ram pressure from the hot intracluster gas that are pushing them back. Uh, but it's not, I would argue, it's, it's really this one that dominates. Thanks, and I have another question. Uh, in the X-ray map, uh, you showed that there, is some, there are some cavities, and uh, do you find that uh, the radio emission is filling these cavities, or is, is there a correlation between the cavities and the, X and the radio emission? There definitely is. If I, this is a zoom in of the X-ray, and then the, the radio. They're, they're, very, um, they're really filled by, by this radio emission. Uh, this is a uh, higher frequency, this is about 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, so this is higher frequency radio observations which will trace uh, the younger population of relativistic particles, so the newer jets. And these are filled with, with that kind of emission. But the older cavities already have lost so much energy that they don't shine at gigahertz wavelengths. Um, and you can actually study that. And, and this one in particular, we're working on a paper now where we see the spectral aging. So we see that uh, the curvature in the spectrum of the radio emission that will give us a really great constraint on the age of these structures based on the age of the, of the particles. Are there, uh, are there any more questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Julie again. Thank you.